Hello, welcome to CS11747, Neural Networks for NLP. This is Graham Newbig, and today I'll be talking about pre-trained sentence and contextualized word representations. So if we remember, neural models are essentially used in NLP as ways to take in inputs such as sentences and embed them in continuous space uh, so that they can be used for some sort of downstream task. And these tasks can include uh, word level embedding in prediction or sentence level embedding in prediction, depending on the task we want to handle, or you know other uh, levels as well. And the goal for today is to discuss contextualized word and sentence representations. So these are in contrast to the word representations that we talked about last time, which handled words outside of context. And I will briefly introduce uh, tasks, data sets, and methods for uh, training these and introduce different training objectives and talk about multitask and transfer learning uh, kind of more in general as well. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is uh, tasks using sentence representations and uh, one question is where would we need or use these sentence representations? So one task that I've talked about pretty broadly is uh, sentence classification. And sentence classification is, uh, you know, kind of straightforward. Uh, we can also have other tasks like paraphrase identification, semantic similarity, entailment, and retrieval. Um, so sentence classification, we classify sentences according to various traits, uh, like the example I've given many times here, uh, this uh, sentiment analysis example. Uh, lots of other things as well, like topic or subjectivity, objectivity, etc., etc. Basically, any label you can put on a sentence could be used here. There's also a pretty broad variety of tasks, uh, which are sentence pair classification. Uh, that have you classify over multiple sentences, where essentially you have one sentence and another sentence, and you put them into a classifier and make some sort of uh, decision over them. One obvious example of this is uh, paraphrase identification, where we essentially identify whether A and B mean the same thing. So if we have Charles O. Prince, 53, was named Mr. Wheel's successor, and Mr. Wheel's longtime confidant, Charles O. Prince, 53, was named his successor. Uh, these essentially have the same core content. Um, however, if we say exactly the same thing, it might be too restrictive. Uh, so many paraphrase data sets use a kind of slightly looser sense of similarity between them. Like, for example, in these two sentences, the first one doesn't say uh, longtime confidant but they were still judged as, uh, as similar. This concept can also be expressed uh, using a continuous value, uh, semantic similarity or relatedness. And basically, this says not a yes-no distinction, but rather whether the sentences are similar to what degree. So. The first one is not related at all. The last one is uh, very highly related, or basically synonymous. And the ones in the middle are more related, but they're not uh, exactly the same. Textual entailment is uh, basically telling you whether you can deduce the truth value of one sentence given another sentence. So if A is true, uh, then B is true. Um, this is, if this is true in both directions, then we're talking about a paraphrase relationship, but this is unidirectional. So if we have the woman bought a sandwich for lunch and the woman bought lunch, uh, the first one entails the second one, but the second one doesn't necessarily entail the first one. There's also contradiction, where if A is true, then B is not true. And there's neutral, where we cannot say either of the above, like the woman bought a sandwich for lunch and the woman bought a sandwich for dinner. So these are just some examples of uh, tasks that you might want to handle. And next, I will 
somewhat switch gears to the idea of multitask learning in general. And I've kind of alluded this to alluded to this with pre-training of word embeddings in the previous lecture. But basically multitask learning is a general term for training on multiple tasks uh, where you would like both of the tasks to kind of improve each other due to their shared characteristics. Transfer learning is a type of multitask learning where we really only care about one of the tasks. Um, so we have a main task that we care about and auxiliary tasks uh, that we don't really care about, but we use them to help the learning of the main task. And to give one example of transfer learning that happens pretty widely within NLP, it's domain adaptation. So domain adaptation is a type of transfer learning, another subset of transfer learning where the output is the same, um, but we want to handle different topics or genres. So this is particularly important as NLP is applied to many different domains, for example. So there's a plethora of tasks in NLP, um, each requiring different varieties of data. Um, so uh, one example is language modeling. And language modeling only requires um, text. And because of this, if you have lots of text, which is the case for English and many other languages, that, and uh, many domains within English, uh, this means you can apply these methods. There's other tasks that require naturally occurring data in some way. So machine translation would be one example of it. Another example might be data that you could directly derive from Wikipedia, uh, which is kind of uh, curated by uh, other people, so you don't need to actually pay to create it yourself. And then there's hand-labeled data uh, that you need to label yourself or pay people to label. And uh, essentially, um, and as I said, this exists in many languages, many domains. And essentially, the things at the top are more conducive to multitask learning just because the data is easier to get. So we do uh, multitask learning, as I said, to increase data. So we perform multitasking when one of the two tasks has uh, fewer data. Uh, so a common example of this is general domain to specific domains. So if you have lots of web text, you'll pre-train, uh, so you'll uh, do multitasking with the web text and uh, then use it to help you adapt to a specific domain like medical or company specific documents, uh, legal documents, et cetera, et cetera. Another example would be high resource language to low resource language. So as I said, English has lots of resources. Other languages like Telugu may have fewer resources. And you can transfer from plain text to labeled text. So you do uh, language modeling and use that to learn a syntactic parser where the syntactic annotations are expensive. Another rule of thumb is uh, you would like to perform multitasking when your tasks are related in some way in that predicting on one task allows you to easily apply to another task easily and effectively. So one very creative example of this uh, by Clark et al. is predicting eye gaze and summarization. So eye gaze is essentially you connect an eye tracker to a, somebody who's reading text and you try to predict where their eyes are falling. And the reason why this is useful is uh, summarization also is trying to predict essentially which parts of a text are the interesting ones that people will read. And because of this, uh, I, it will correlate with eye gaze. It won't be exactly the same, but it will correlate with the places where people actually did read. So this is a kind of example of creative thinking that you can come up with when you're doing multitask learning. Uh, one thing to note is that the language modeling task, uh, just predicting words, which you'll see in um, the following sections, it's actually quite uh, useful uh, for, the, um, for many varieties of multitasking. And the basic idea why is once you're able to predict sentences well, um, you're able to say a lot of things about them, syntax, semantics, etc. So I, I will go into a little bit more detail of that later.
So standard multitask learning, um, you train representations to do well on multiple tasks at once. So you essentially have uh, a language modeling task and a tagging task, and you uh, trade off. Um, this can be done by choosing mini batches of training data uh, from multiple, one of the multiple tasks at different points in training. So maybe just alternating between the tasks or sampling mini batches with some percentage, et cetera, et cetera. There are many, many examples of this. It's actually one of the prevailing paradigms in uh, NLP now. And it goes back all the way to a famous paper by Colbert and Weston um, on natural language processing from scratch, where essentially this multitask learning was a very important component. Another very prevalent example is pre-training. In pre-training, first you train on one task and then train on another. So um, you train uh, an encoder like for a task with lots of data like language modeling or translation, and then you use it to initialize an encoder for tagging, uh, for example. And uh, this is also very prevalent widely used in word embeddings and also pre-trained sentence encoders or contextualized word representations nowadays. So um, there's a couple reasons why you might choose pre-training. Actually, pre-training is kind of a subset of standard multitask learning where you first sample mini batches only from one task and then sample mini batches solely from another task. So it's kind of like standard multitask learning with a very specific mini batch selection uh, like schedule, I guess. Um, but there's a big advantage of it, which is that you don't necessarily need to know the t downstream task as you're training the first task. So people can use kind of generic tasks like language modeling for the first part, release their embeddings, and then you can fine tune them later, which is kind of a very uh, standard thing to do nowadays. So thinking about multitasking um, in pre-trained representations in particular, um, many methods uh, have been proposed to do this, and they all have names like, you know, skip thought, pair MT, Cove, Elmo, Bert along with uh, pre-trained models, uh, Roberta, et cetera, et cetera. And because of this, it actually becomes a little bit difficult to understand what exactly is going on under the hood, uh, how do you compare these methods, and uh, other things like this. And long story short, these often refer to a combination of multiple things, specifically the model, the underlying neural network architecture, Nowadays, this normally refers to transformers, but there are other options as well. Um, the training objective, what objective is used to pre-train, and this is usually some variety of uh, language modeling. And the data, so what data the authors choose to train the model on. So even if you use exactly the same model in training objective, uh, the data is, uh, can make a very big difference, of course. And one thing you should remember is that these are often conflated. So if you say something like, um, well, BERT outperforms ELMO, you're talking about many different things. You're talking about the, the model, the training objective, and the data. Uh, so which one of those uh, contributed the most? You might have to dig deeper into the paper or even do your own experiments to really understand. OK. So first I'm going to talk about training sentence representations, and then after that I'm going to talk about training contextualized word representations. So um, the first method for training sentence representations that I'd like to talk about is the, the first one I talked about essentially, which was language modeling. And so language modeling, um, the first kind of example of this uh, by Diane Le, uh, 2015, is um, they used an LSTM-based model, a regular language model training objective. So this is one you already know from your LSTM uh, or RNN language modeling uh, class. And the data that they used was um, data for text classification 
or on lots of Amazon reviews. So basically, like as I said, they just take an LSTM and use it to predict the next word. And how do they use it downstream? So basically, they take the trained LSTM language model and apply it to uh, initialize the parameters of a text classification model with this and apply it to that, um, uh, apply it to text classification. So this was a very interesting result when it first came out. It's you know, been superseded by other methods that are most more common. Um, but one very interesting and important thing that they showed was, number one, this is really effective. You know, you uh, pre-train a language model and then apply it to text classification and it just uh, works better. Another important thing that they showed was that even when you do this only on the data that the classification model is trained on. So you have exactly the same data for this um, LM and the classification. It still leads to improvements. And I think this can be attributed to the fact that you know, text classification may only be a single training signal for each sentence, whereas language modeling is uh, requiring you to predict every word in the sentence. And predicting every word from, you know, all of the possible words in your vocabulary is a much more difficult task that requires more learning of representations than, uh, you know, predicting a single uh, label over each sentence. So I, th I think this is a very interesting result. This was uh, then expanded uh, several years later to, uh, to transformer models. And basically the objective is the same. It's a language modeling objective, left to right language modeling objective. And it was trained on uh, something called the books corpus uh, using uh, transformer models. And um, on downstream tasks, uh, this was uh, used for uh, fine tuning and on other tasks, it was uh, like, for example, uh, the sentence pair classification tasks, it used additional multi-sentence training to uh, kind of refine the representations there. So um, this was the original GPT. Uh, we hear GPT-2 and GPT-3 nowadays, uh, which are probably more famous, but basically this was um, one of the early examples of transformer-based language models being applied to transfer. Another method that you could use, which was also examined in the Diane Light paper, is um, uh, autoencoding. And the way the autoencoding works is from a single sentence vector, you try to reconstruct the sentence. So on the left side, um, you have uh, an encoder here, which doesn't do any uh, word prediction. And then on the right side, you have a decoder uh, that tries to take a single vector and estimate each of, and uh, output each of the words in the sentence. And I think this is an interesting uh, training objective as well, um, because in contrast to language modeling, where basically each individual vector needs to have enough information to predict uh, the next word, here you are asking the sentence itself to uh, predict the next, um, to predict the entire sentence. And because of that, you would hope that this model, or sorry, this method would improve the amount of information included in the single vector that leads into outputting the sentence. However, autoencoders are um, a little bit unsatisfying in their performance, and perhaps one reason is, in general, when you use an autoencoder, this autoencoder is um, basically trying to encourage you to reconstruct the same sentence using a decoder. And then the encoder representations are usually used as the thing that you're going to be initializing or um, fine, uh, like fine tuning or using as uh, sentence representations. 
However, the decoder also plays a very important role here. And because the decoder plays an important role, actually some things that you can re reconstruct with only the decoder uh, don't necessarily need to be included in the sentence representations here. So for example, at the end of the sentence, once you've seen the initial part of the sentence, kind of a language model in the decoder might uh, like kick in and then you don't need the, the information or um, from the input as much anymore. So um, uh, this model has been, has some success, but isn't as widely used nowadays. So another uh, objective here uh, that was uh, used for sentence representations is uh, sentence level context prediction. And if we think about the uh, the SIBO model that I talked about um, before, sorry, uh, the Skipgram model that I talked about um, in the previous class, the Skipgram model basically took in a word and it tried to predict the surrounding words, if you remember. So this uh, paper, Skip Thought Vectors, is essentially the same idea applied to sentence representations. So again, um, because this is an older paper, this uses an LSTM model, uh, which was kind of the standard at the time. And you take in an individual sentence and predict the previous sentence and the next sentence. So the reason why this is, uh, is good is it kind of gives you an idea of how each sentence fits in a discourse. Um, and it's a little bit more of a uh, difficult task than simply autoencoding because you don't just need to remember the individual words, but you also kind of need to interpret them and their importance in uh, like the whole discourse. Okay. So um, this can be used downstream in sentence classification. Uh, and other tasks like this, and was very popular or early sentence embedding. And it also leads into some of the things that are used in BERT uh, nowadays. So another um, really important method that I think people should know is uh, this work here. And the um, basic idea is uh, the model here, actually they tried many different models. Um, but the important thing is the objective of predicting whether two phrases or sentences are, or are paraphrases or not. And um, an example of where you can get this data is uh, from something called the paraphrase database. And the paraphrase database essentially was created from bilingual data uh, where they translate into one language and then they translate back into another, um, into the original language, giving you uh, essentially um, phrases that are the same in uh, one language but different in other languages, which we can kind of assume are paraphrases. And this objective is really useful because up until this point, all of the other methods that I've been talking about have relied kind of essentially only on distributional uh, characteristics of the words. And when you rely on distributional characteristics of the words, uh, for example, words that are appear in very similar contexts but are actually different um, will get similar embeddings. So some examples of this are named entities. Uh, named entities of British last names or something like this will tend to be placed very similar in the space. Um, and so let's say you have two, uh, two British people and you say, uh, John Smith went to the store and John, uh, John Fredrickson went to the store, John uh, Doe went to the store. These are not paraphrase is of each other. They're, they have very different information that's very important to distinguish, uh, but many methods uh, that are based solely on language modeling would not be able to do this. So if you want to do something like entailment or um, entailment or paraphrase identification, 
these kind of methods that explicitly consider paraphrases uh, do better. And specifically what, what they do is they have a margin-based method where you have positive examples that actually are paraphrases, negative examples that are not paraphrases but seem similar, and upweight them. And this can be used for sentence similarity, uh, classification, etc. So one interesting result uh, from this work, uh, which I think is important to consider for following work and actually um, has kind of, uh, you know, been examined in, in following work to some extent, is that here, interesting LS, uh, interestingly, LSTMs work well on in-domain data but simpler models such as word averaging generalize better to new uh, domains. So um, you have a more complicated model and a less complicated model. And um, on in-domain data, the more complicated model does better. On out-of-domain data, the less complicated model does better. So that's an important uh, thing to keep in mind. Uh, you know, you, you might want to be careful that you're not overfitting to uh, the individual domain that you're training on uh, and making mistaken conclusions there. So this uh, data has been expanded to large-scale paraphrase data. So essentially you get a large parallel corpus. Um, you translate the check side into English using a state-of-the-art NMT system and um, you can get an automated score and annotate a sample of the data um, so that uh, you have data that you think has a very uh, high probability of being clean paraphrase data. So this gives you a huge corpus of paraphrases that could allow you to train these uh, kind of uh, paraphrastic sentence embeddings. Um, and the corpus is huge, but it includes noise. So um, the trained representations uh, work quite well in generalized. So I'd, I think this uh, direction of research is actually somewhat uh, like underappreciated in, um, in a lot of uh, kind of pre-trained representations. And I, I'd like us to uh, seriously consider uh, this as uh, one technique that we should definitely be considering. Okay, um, so another a very famous example of sentence representations is something called InfraSent. And um, it's basically based on entailment plus transfer. And uh, the previous objectives used no human labels, but what if uh, we use supervised training for a task such as entailment? Um, and the reason why entailment is kind of a good task is for the same reason that paraphrase data is kind of good data to use here, which is that many of the tasks that we care about in um, in downstream, such as a textual entailment or um, paraphrase identification, require some concept of whether the content of two sentences is similar or not. Um, and there's also other examples of like pre-training and then fine-tuning uh, or continuing pre-training on a supervised task. Um, and there's a couple hypotheses that you could make here. One is that the task is more difficult and requires capturing nuance. So uh, you could improve your accuracy by doing so. So then the answer would be yes, that this sort of super tra vice training would help. Um, on the other hand, if your data is much smaller, uh, you might uh, assume that this would not help. So. Um, they used a standard bi-directional LSTM model um, and data from uh, two large uh, kind of entailment or natural language inference corpora. And this tended to be better than supervised objectives uh, such as skip thought. Um, there's also uh, some interesting work recently, which I uh, didn't put on the slides, uh, from uh, Sam Bowman's group on, I believe the name is Stilts, which is examines uh, intermediate training uh, on supervised tasks and how it affects downstream tasks and kind of more modern uh, representations. And uh, I would encourage you to take a look at that as well if this uh, sounds interesting.
Okay, next I'd like to move to contextualized word representations. And contextualized word representations, essentially, instead of one vector per sentence, we're calculating one vector per word. Um, so uh, we have uh, multiple vectors per, uh, um, per sentence based on how many uh, words you have in the sentence. These can be used for tagging, for example, or they could be fed into a classifier uh, to do these word predictions and other uh, methods like this. So then the question becomes, how do you train this representation? So kind of early work on this uh, topic looked at central word prediction. And um, the model um, in both cases, in both this context of EC and ELMO uh, papers, were a bidirectional uh, LSTM. And the objective is basically predict uh, the word given uh, the surrounding context. So um, the figure here is maybe a little bit small, but what you do is you run an LSTM backwards you run an LSTM forwards, and you use a representation from everything but the central LSTM state in order to um, uh, predict the uh, current word. And so you can do this for, for every, um, uh, every word in the sentence. Um, this was trained on a 2 billion word corpus, and the vectors were used for things like sentence completion, word sense disambiguation, proof very helpful. Um, the more famous relative of this, ELMO, um, is actually quite similar in its objective, uh, but it's a bit different um, in that instead of uh, predicting the central word from the left and right, it trains a left to right LSTM, a right to left LSTM language model, and then just kind of concatenates their representations together. So. <clears throat> This was also uh, trained on an L LM data set. And um, in addition to just using the representations, it used the representations from each layer and fine tuned the weights of a linear combination of layers on a downstream task. And uh, Elmo proved uh, useful essentially for many different uh, tasks and it kind of kicked off the boom in, uh, in pre-trained representations, I guess. And uh, so next we can move to uh, BERT. So there's, there's other objectives like uh, learning from uh, translation. There's a, a method called COVE, which uh, learns from translation. Um, and uh, other things like this, ERNIE, which learns from entities. I'm going to jump directly into BERT, which is the um, uh, masked word prediction objective. And this is very similar in principle, or kind of in general principle, but different in the implementation details than context to VEC or ELMO. And the way it works is the model is essentially a multi-layer self-attention. Um, so it's, uh, it's transformer models, and we input a sentence or a pair of sentences with a special token at the beginning of the sentence, and it, it importantly uses subword uh, representations. Uh, and so all of these things um, kind of feed into how BERT works. Um, and the objective of is uh, mass word prediction plus next uh, sentence prediction. And uh, BERT itself was trained on um, something called the books corpus, which is a large corpus of books and uh, English Wikipedia. Um, so basically to uh, go into the mass word prediction objective that feeds into BERT, um, what you do is you mask out words in the input. So you do some sort of manipulation to them. Uh, for example, 80% of the time, uh, BERT substitutes the input words with a special mask token that doesn't provide any information about the word itself. 10% of the time, it substitutes input words with random words. Um, so this is kind of a, uh, you know, 
giving it a word that's not the, the actual word itself, um, adding some noise. And 10% of the time, uh, there is no change. Um, so 10% of the time, no change. The basic idea here is you don't want the model to completely forget the word it has read in. So you have to know that some of the time, the word it reads in is actually useful in making the output prediction. So this is like context of Eck or Elmo, um, but it's better suited for multi-layer self-attention models. And the reason why, um, and also maybe not just um, like multi-layer self-attention based transformer models, but it's also useful in that it allows you to encode both the left and right context at the same time, as opposed to doing it directionally. So um, something like context effect or Elmo, um, the representations you learn are fundamentally directional. But if, the, if you use masked word prediction, you could essentially encode the whole sentence at the same time. And f um, you could pass information from the left side to the right side to the left side to the right side, and then make the final prediction of the central word. Um, so. This is an important difference here, and I, I think it really increases the power of uh, the BERT-based representations as well, because you don't have any left-to-right constraint on the context you're using in any particular representation. Um, BERT uses uh, one other objective, uh, consecutive sentence prediction. So this is kind of lightly uh, related to maybe what is used in infrasent or um, uh, actually skip thought vectors. Um, so the basic idea is that you have a classification of two sentences as either being consecutive within the discourse or not being consecutive in the discourse. And um, so a negative example would be the man uh, mask to the store, penguin mask are flightless birds. Um, so these are unrelated sentences. And then we have the man went to a uh, mask store. He bought a gallon mask milk. Um, and these are consecutive sentences, so these would be labeled as next. So there has been some uh, question called on whether this uh, objective is important at all. Uh, but um, basically, the intuition behind it is if you're using the class token to make this distinction between next sentences and not next sentences, probably you should be better at sentence classification or sentence pair classification tasks that uh, then use this uh, class token downstream. So um, the, first, uh, the first objective here, the master word prediction objective, should be useful if you want contextualized word embeddings to make some sort of you know word by word prediction, whereas this class token um, training objective should be useful for sentence pair or uh, sentence classification. That's the intuition anyway. So another um, recently popular model, Roberta, is very, very similar to BERT. So the model is the same as BERT. The training objective is the same as BERT, but they actually train, uh, drop the sentence prediction objective but then they train for much, much longer. So the argument is essentially that BERT is undertrained. It should have been trained for longer, and that would have improved its performance. Um, it's trained on the same data, and results are empirically much better on many tasks, um, pretty consistently better on, uh, on some tasks. Uh, one interesting thing that I have found in my work on uh, knowledge-based um, uh, language model uh, probing, which we'll be talking about in a following class, is that actually Roberta underperforms on that task. Um, and I think uh, one caveat is I feel like Roberta works very well on many tasks that kind of require um, abstracting away from details of the text, but it might uh, perform uh, less well on tasks where you need to kind of remember individual entities or remember individual um, uh, facts or things like this. So um, it, that's an interesting uh, study that could potentially be done in more 
uh, in more detail, you know, like what, uh, what are advantages of particular uh, models. So um, some recent interesting developments uh, here in uh, the pre-trained uh, language modeling space um, are, or one interesting development is Electra. And basically this is a different idea of a training objective. Uh, it uses essentially a discriminator to discriminate between real and fake data. And we're gonna be talking a little bit more about this uh, kind of adversarial training method in later classes. But just to give a, a basic idea, what you do is you sample words from a language model by masking out words and sampling them. And so you essentially get a perturbed um, input. And uh, what you need to do is you need to predict when the input has been perturbed. So you need to distinguish when a word is the same as the original or uh, different than the original. So if we have the artist sold the car, the discriminator um, simply makes a binary prediction over whether, over, um, whether a word has been replaced or not. And the um, motivation behind this model is faster training of uh, language models. Um, sorry, of uh, uh, contextualized word embedding models. And the reason why this may be faster is because now instead of predicting over a small number of masked out words, we're making predictions over every word in the sentence, which gives you more uh, training signal. Um, the disadvantage of this is it's a bit more complicated. You need a generator uh, as well. Um, and both models are trained kind of jointly, but yeah, that, uh, that's the idea behind this method. So another um, recent development, uh, which was actually developed uh, here at CMU in concert with Google is um, a permutation-based autoregressive language model um, and uh, with the addition of long context. So this is something called XLNet and the model itself is still a transformer model, uh, but it includes longer context. And what I mean by this is essentially, instead of modeling only sentence pairs, or um, uh, instead of modeling only sentence, individual sentence pairs, it also includes the representations from the previous sentences uh, that um, can be used to make uh, additional um, like the uh, disambiguation of the words in the current sentence. And we're going to be talking about longer document models later in the classes, so I won't go into the details, but it's a method called Transformer Excel that kind of combines two of the ideas of uh, RNN-based language models and Transformer-based language models. The training objective is a kind of uh, interesting or unusual training objectives. So the training objective is bi-directional. It can do prediction in both directions, but the, um, the order is still in a incremental order. So a normal uh, language model predicts usually in a fixed order from left to right, but here they randomly sample in order and then predict the words in that order. And they do this efficiently using um, massed attention. So, you, but you might uh, predict like word number one, then word number three, then word number two, or word number three, word number one, word number two. And these are all kind of just randomized uh, every time. And the advantage of doing this is uh, that it essentially um, allows you to, number one, learn a standard language model that can be used easily for text generation and, and things like this, um, but still allow you to kind of consider bi-directional context, not just a unidirectional context. Um, this was trained on uh, much more data, so 39 billion tokens uh, from books, Wikipedia, and the web, and uh, achieved very good results. Another general trend um, that has been interesting recently is compact uh, pre-trained models. 
So large models are expensive, and can we make them smaller and uh, more efficient? And there's quite a few examples of this. I'd just like to mention uh, two that are kind of popular and also stereotypical in their approach. Uh, so lots of other models follow similar approaches. And the first one is uh, parameter sharing. Uh, so this is used in the Albert model of Land et al. Uh, 2019. Um, and the way it works is basically by making the word embeddings smaller. Um, so the word embeddings uh, that are input into the model actually um, if your vocabulary is large, are a pretty large uh, portion of the parameters. And also, interestingly, it, it shares parameters of the transformer model across layers. So um, the first layer, second layer, third layer, all of the layers um, can share the same parameters. Uh, so this might be counterintuitive uh, at first, but um, it apparently works uh, relatively well uh, in training uh, more compact models. So a second approach is using the idea of uh, knowledge distillation, which I talked about in a previous class. And what you do essentially is you get a smaller model and you train that model to try to match the distribution of regular uh, BERT, essentially. And the idea being that, you know, if you have a smaller model that makes similar predictions, uh, then you're likely to have similar representations as well. So when looking at all of these, um, I've talked about individual named methods like, you know, BERT or ELMO or ELECTRA or other things like this, XLNET. Um, but as I mentioned at the beginning of the class, they all kind of conflate some things like which model should we use, um, which data should we use, and uh, which training objective should we use. And unfortunately, this space is a little bit, um, I don't know, less uh, well-organized than uh, it could be. But um, there's not a super extensive comparison between models. Um, for, uh, so, you know, a lot of people nowadays use uh, transformer models uh, as the underlying model architecture without even really thinking about it. Um, Nonetheless, uh, Weeding et al. found that simple word averaging uh, can be more robust to out-of-domain text. Um, and Devlin et al. compared unidirectional and bidirectional transformers, but no comparison to LSTMs like ELMO. Um, again, this might be just because uh, uh, transformers are faster to train uh, in some cases uh, or on some hardware. But uh, yeah, that's a, um, a comparison. So. Do we really know, you know, transformers are the best model for learning these representations? I don't think there's conclusive evidence of this, or at least I don't know of any. Um, so, uh, and one other thing is uh, Yang et al. have an ablation where similar data to BERT is used and improvements are shown. So they demonstrate kind of longer context can be useful. Which training objective? Um, this is not a super extensive comparison, but I guess it's better than the model comparison. Um, but still, even when people pose new methods, it's very often not um, you know, tested on the same data, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, Zhang and Bowman uh, control for training uh, data and find that a bidirectional LM uh, seems better than an MT encoder, uh, machine translation encoder. Um, uh, Devlin et al. found that the next sentence prediction objective was a good complement to the LM objective, but again, then the Roberta paper kind of uh, showed that that was not the case. And then the next question is which data should we use? Again, there's not a very extensive comparison. Um, uh, Zhang and Bowman uh, find that more data is probably better, and there's also some uh, interesting follow-up results with respect to this from the same group. Um, and Yang et al. showed that there are some improvements by adding more data from the web, but this is actually not 100% consistent uh, across tasks. So um, data with context is probably essential to learn, you know, multi-sentence uh, context. So this is my... Um, uh, this is basically what I have for today. This is a very interesting topic with lots of 
uh, things uh, to discuss and lots of questions. In terms of a particular discussion topic, I would like people to think a little bit about the tasks that you are interested in uh, yourself for your research and think about which sorts of models, data, and training objectives would be ideal for pre-training for this particular task. So uh, just to give an example, um, if you, I, I spoke a little bit about how par using paraphrase identification can be very useful uh, for particular tasks where you really need to know if two sentences are um, are in a paraphrase relation or not. Um, so you might be interested in other tasks. So uh, think a little bit about the design decisions that would go into an ideal pre-trained uh, representation for your task. So thank you very much. And that's all I have for